Radio. Today we're having Keith Anthony Blanchard on, and he's going to speak on a little bit about how to get through those tough times that often are all about leading to open doors that are much better. You know, at this particular time, when we may be watching CNN, when we may be watching or listening or talking to people about all the newest terrorist attacks or how, or maybe going through your own terror of your own life, your own crashes or your own financial burdens, how do we find a way to be able to get past our pity party and past our grief and and connect back in with God. Keith Anthony Blanchard says, what if you had a chance to talk with God, asking him as many questions as you wanted to? And you know, it started one June morning in 1996 when Keith Blanchard, a musician and composer, found himself with just such an opportunity when he was awakened by a voice that seemed to permeate every fiber of his being. And he will tell us more about that, but it led us to the divine principle, which is the result of transcription of many of the lively talks that Keith has had with God and all about helping him to get out of his closed doors and into his new open doors. So without any hesitation, we will bring in Keith. Hi, Keith. How are you today? Keith, are you there? All right. Well, we're going to let uh, Bill um, get Keith in there, and uh, he has been trying to get him into the radio show. So we're going to um, continue telling you a little bit more about Keith. Now, Keith was born on November 30th, 1963, in Louisiana, and had a typical middle class. Catholic upbringing in his early teens, and he often entertained himself by pondering the big questions like we all do about God and the universe. Little did he know that the day would come when those questions would form the spiritual foundation upon which he would build the rest of his life. In his later 20s, Keith went through a crisis that stripped him of everything he held dear. And how many of us have not had similar situations and left him with no choice but to turn inward for answers? This he did, but the peace and stability he so wanted still eluded him. So when he was 32... Celestial beings began to appear to him, sharing glimpses of his future and the world's. Not only did they enlighten and guide him, they instructed him to pass their message on to others so that they too could learn a higher way of being. Living and now 50 and living a peaceful, stable life, Keith continues to pursue his passion to both learn and teach about truth. And that's all it's really about, right, guys? It's about truth. And when you hear truth, it just rings with the right vibration. And sometimes it has nothing to do with how much education someone has or how much uh, college they've gone through or how much uh, they even can be necessarily a great talker. Truth rings with a very special vibration, and we all know when we're hearing it. So we're going to look in and see if Keith is. Keith, are you with us today yet? All right. So I'm going to go into my room, and I'm going to, first of all, look and see if there's anybody that may be in the inquick that would be all about. We have Marie from Connecticut, and um, Marie says, Hi, Anne-Marie. I would like to know if you can see a new job for me coming up, at least part-time, and do you have any insight into this job? Many blessings. So as we wait for Keith 
and Bill to get on, um, it says, um, so we're going to look at um, her question here, and it's for Marie, knowing is she going to have uh, any part-time work coming up? But first I'm going to start with an angel blessing reading for Marie. And Marie says, and your angels say, Lately, there's been a sense that you perhaps have forgotten what sometimes it is known in the Bible or in our, uh, you know, teachings um, that God helps those who help themselves, right? So, Marie, your reading says that you've always done an ethical and wonderful job, and your reading says that Oftentimes, you are somebody that can uh, make friends very easily. I show within about three months' time that you will have somebody to be able to escort you, take you into a wonderful opportunity for work, stability, and more of your hours that you want. So we're looking at what could be three months, but it could also be three weeks, I will say. Time is always elastic, and we are going to uh, give you that time frame. In the meantime, remember, you have to help yourself as you also lead into your new job. So get out there. Let people know at your work front what you want so that they don't have to read your mind. Don't automatically assume others are more qualified. Get yourself going. And now, and now, we are going to go for Keith Anthony. (laughs) (laughs) How are you, Keith? Uh, well, I was rustling to get everything in order uh, as quick as I could, but I'm well, wonderful. I'm Thank you for you asking. How are you, Anne Marie? I'm doing great. I was uh, giving your full history, and I was reading up from your website. I do want to say that if you guys want to uh, maybe scope out um, the divine principle anchoring heaven on earth with Keith Anthony Blanchard, then um, Anthony, your website is. I'm sorry, what was that last part? Yes, my, my website is Keith Anthony Blanchard. You can find all of my creations there, everything I'm about, everything I'm doing up to, cre- uh, up to the present point in my life, yes. And tell us about, um, and I was telling the listeners about how we all have tough times sometimes and closed doors. Tell us about some of your situations that led you to enlightenment. Well, it was just that. I mean, exactly just that. I was in a situation in my life. Uh, I was with a girl for 10 years, and we know what those kinds of things can do when we're severed from an experience of being with someone for a long time, even in death or uh, loving relationships here while we're alive. But my situation was with someone who uh, I was with for 10 years, and we were pulled apart for whatever reasons. Uh, We were just not working. And... uh, I found myself in very deep states of depression. Um, You know, the thought of suicide does go through, I'm thinking, everyone's mind at least once or twice in their life, though you never act it out. You you chew on that kind of idea just to see (laughs) if you're going to think it the same thought twice or move in another direction. Well, I had a pretty dark cloud over me for quite a while. So much so, I I couldn't bear the cross, um, at least at that point. I find myself getting down on my metaphorical knee and praying out loud to God, you know, and from, from one asking, though I said a prayer for three months, excuse me, three weeks to a month, the prayer was, I need to hear your voice. And I was passionate and sincere and I was salivating. Uh, I wanted it. And again, I do believe it was in my very first asking, there was enough of supplication there that I was going to have God talk to me. And lo and behold, three weeks or so after a night of playing music, I was awakened out of my sleep by a voice. Uh, Good morning, Keith. It's time for you to wake up. So I look around the room, and there's no one there. Uh, I'm thinking I heard a dream voice. lay back in the bed with the intentions of going back to sleep, and the voice spoke again and permeated every fiber of what I know as me. 
um, my immediate proximity. It was everywhere. It was in, in the molecules. I heard the voice. I smelled the voice. I tasted the voice. I saw the voice. I felt the voice. It was such an amazing multidimensional conversation. And I was impregnated with volumes of information, which eight years later became the best-selling book known as The Divine Principle. So to answer your question, those issues, those challenges, those opportunities, let's call them, that arise are your soul's way of doing you the best favor you can even imagine, though you may not see it at the time. You have to trust your brother, me, that went through that dance and that dynamic and walked that path to find myself here now sitting in his chair in front of this microphone giving this interview. Those opportunities are there. Uh, they are as opportunities. You can bet on that. And you just have to find your way through them. You have to okay your way through them. Okay your way. What do you mean by that? You have to make yourself happy in a situation that seems bad. You, you, can, you cannot have your peace shaken. You have to be steady as a rock. For example, I know, and I've done this myself, people who uh, I work with, I, I have them okay their way through their fears. They have a fear that crops up in their life, and of course the first thing you want to do is resist and turn away from it. And the best thing you can do is take that deep breath as if you're diving off a high diving board that you've never jumped off before and one two three and step into it mm, and of, i like that of, of course at first it's going to feel funky it's going to feel icky you might even regret <laughs> taking that step but after a minute after a minute and a half and then two minutes the icky the funky all that stuff slowly but surely starts to fall away because you realize I'm okay. And then the I'm okay window gets bigger and bigger and bigger until the next thing you know, you're well through the threshold. You, in fact, you're on the other side of your issue, and you are now illumined forever. You can never undo um, whatever it is that you have just transformed yourself with. Um, it will never bother you ever again. You'll be much lighter. Your life has much more peace. Keith, do you feel, now I've always felt that um, for those that do not necessarily have God speaking aloud to them, I've always felt that there's a huge difference between our analytical mind and our heart, and that I feel that the message that comes from our heart is of God and is of purity, whereas the voice that comes from our analytical mind is those negative thoughts, those depressing thoughts. But my feeling is, is that we aren't we all capable of healing, hearing heartfelt God messages if we only listen internally to our heart? Yeah, absolutely. And how do you differentiate between the two would probably be a question from someone in the listening audience. Okay, so how do I know when my heart is talking to me? How to know when it's my egoistic or my analytical mind that wants to get me just some of those things that I want? Well, it's truly, I'm not anyway implying or insinuating you cannot have the things you, quote, desire or want. But until you're into a stage of spiritual development, that you can split that hair, that difference, that fine line. Take it as a rule, as a guide, or as a measurement stick that it's likely, it could be, the things that you are wanting are coming from your analytical mind. Now, what you can do to realize that you're in your heart, or God speaking to you, is it will not come about as things that I want. It will come through as passion. That there is no way I can be happy in my life until this drive is met. Mm -hmm. Until this drive is met. Explain that. <clears throat> For example, there's no way in my life I could not have played music and been happy. That's something I had to carry out. 
I had to perform that task because it's my joy. Uh, though right. I was beaten down by society, told by parents, Keith, you know, go get a real job. <laughs> Cut your hair. Mm-hmm. Go get a mm-hmm. real job. And no matter what, I could not have done that. That was almost even beyond my choice. Mm-hmm. Though I had a choice and could have made different choices, it was beyond my own will. It was something I had to carry out. That was God's presence in me because if music is art, art is creativity, God is the creator. Mm-hmm. I would have lived a life of absolute, <laughs> I would have been pitiful, I would have been a mess. Right. But, but I've learned uh, and that throughout my life, God doesn't only speak to us, you know, through the language of the heart or even in our thoughts um, or even in meditation. You know, for me, a uh, beautiful sound on the stereo, the sweet smell of a flower, kind words mm-hmm. out of someone's mouth. Mm-hmm. These are all manifestations of God that people are saying, well, Keith, I want to be talked to. Well, what I'm saying is don't divide. That is God literally talking to you. Your job is to decipher, decode whatever message that might be synchronistically playing it out as to why you heard that particular song, smelled that sweet flower, or heard someone say something really, really kind. So I am learning still at this place in my life to be present as much as I possibly can and to whatever depth I possibly can because there is nothing else happening, nothing anywhere ever that is happening except God. Keith, when you um, think about the um, terrorism that's going on in the world right now, and you and you see those people who believe that they're hearing the voice of God or the or Muhammad, their God. And and it's all about killing and it's all about um the violence and and um martyrdom and getting blown up. How do you feel about that? Just taking it away from your unusual uh, yeah. thoughts, just what well, your thoughts about that. One, um, I'm glad you asked this question. It might be somewhat difficult or challenging for me to answer, but I'm really glad because in so doing, you are helping me pull out something inside of me. Uh, I, I'm not in denial about the events that are going on in the world. I don't turn a blind eye out of mind, out of sight. I, I don't do that. I'm very much aware of the the dynamic that's taking place. You know, I think these people are taking something beautiful, Muslim and Islam, and taking the beautiful expression that that it was meant to be as a way to celebrate Creator or God, and they're perverting it, and they're perverting it for a selfish, ignorant agenda. Now, as these events unfold all around me when I watch TV or Facebook or whatever, I'm very much aware of the presence of this vibrational dark energy in the world. I don't plug into the system. If we liken this to, you know, we have a beautiful plant and we want it to grow, so we water it. We give it our attention. Energy follows attention. And so, likewise, if you water a weed, it will grow the same as the beautiful plant. The beautiful plant grows and we appreciate it. But we plug our energies into the weed or this stuff that's going into the world, and it grows, and we despise it. Mm-hmm. And so what is happening is, this is a man, and people will often do not want to accept this as a truth. That I know it's very convincing. It's convincingly so that those people out there are doing this to us. That is part of the problem. Because it takes responsibility for each and every person to resolve what is happening. So what I'm saying is, whether you like it or not, this is a manifestation of yourself. And how you treat that manifestation is going to turn into the beautiful flower or the weed. And Uh so I'm, I'm in the same position as everyone else. I don't pretend to know more. I don't pretend to be better by my views because they do affect me. When I see someone who's beheaded or some children who are whatever, whatever the scenario may be that the media, which is twisted and owned by those uh-huh. people who are doing uh-huh. those things, I'm very much uh-huh. aware of that. 
-hmm. But all that being said, it comes down, it comes back home. It comes back to you. What is it you want in your world? People are arming themselves with guns, thinking that, you know, people with guns do die. <laughs> uh, and my protection does not come from an exterior source as a fire weapon, a firearm. My protection comes from my connection, with, which is, it's my peace. I don't feel affected or threatened by that dynamic that is taking place in the world because of my connection. I feel grounded. I feel safe. Mm -hmm. So, um, as you were telling me before, um, you felt that you had done some um, study with uh, in the east, is that, am I correct, or or a, a or what is going? You had something to do uh, with a Maharishi or something like that. <laughs> in 19, 1998, mm -hmm. I learned of the pre presence of an avatar by the name of Sathya Sai Baba in India. Mm -hmm. I started reading every book I can find, mm -hmm. and in so doing, throughout all the books that I've read, the people who wrote these books are scientists, doctors. Um, analytical people going over there to disprove uh, the hype that they found mm -hmm. that they heard about this particular holy man. Well, what was the, the hype? People, what, what was the hype? Let us know. Well, that this man, there's a man on earth now who can materialize at will that can bring people back to the dead and change the weather right in front of your face and all these divine attributes um, that was, he was said to possess. So they go over there to disprove all this, and these people are the ones coming back writing these books saying, I don't know what that was. <laughs> and so um, a resounding theme throughout all these books I read is that when they actually had the opportunity to meet him in person, he's not a man you can walk up to and stick out your hand and say, hello, my name is Keith Blanchard. How are you? No, there are 35, 50,000 people in his ashram daily, and he walks among the multitude. And if you are fortunate, he will interview personally, which he does about 10 people every day. And some of these people that have read these books had this personal interview and wrote in these books that if you were visited in a dream state by Sathya Sai Baba, you are not dreaming. You are actually being visited. Well, one night in 1999, after many sleep episodes uh, with Sai Baba, and believe me, I'm as conscious then as I, <laughs> as I am mm -hmm. talking to you on, on this radio program, if sometimes if not more so. But mm -hmm. he came to me, when I came to a state of consciousness, he was standing across the river. And he says to me, he says, Keith, I want you to come to India to see me. And immediately I go into analytical mode. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Is this real? Where, would, where will I get the money? How will I put this together? I've never done such a thing. Mm -hmm. And he tells me, he says, Keith, if you came here to put your feet on Indian soil, to turn around and go home, do this for me and stay out of your mind. You have to learn to transcend your doubt and disbelief. So I wake up in the morning. Wow, that was pretty awesome. Uh, going through the same process of how will I make this happen? And I realized that if this is ever going to happen, it's going to happen if I let go. And I let go. And two weeks later, I get a phone call. Hello. Hi, Keith. My name is Debbie. Hi, Debbie. Keith, we have a mutual friend by the name of Navam. And I hear you want to go to India to see a holy man. Yes, Debbie, this is true. Keith, I'm a flight attendant. I got some companion passes for the year that are about to expire, and I would hate that to happen. No, you want to go into India to see a holy man. Can I give you a first-class round trip ticket? Mm. <laughs> and so, yeah. so three, three months later, I take off to South India to experience the most towering divinity that has ever graced the face of this earth. This is known as the highest incarnation of God to ever come to this earth. Not that there's a higher or lower, but I use that word to describe the most powerful impact that the Godhead has ever made on this planet. So while I was there, I had a tape recorder, and I logged my entire experience for two weeks. And in fact, I just read, um, waiting on my first box of return books from the book that I've written from that experience called For the Love of God. I'm waiting for that box of books. I'm waiting for someone to knock on my door in this moment. <laughs> so. Yeah, I have that on your blog. I have yeah. that book on your blog. It was a fantastic experience. I, I had the opportunity to see how the divine walks, talks, acts, and behaves. Um, so you did meet him. So you did meet him. I did not 
meet him per se in the form of a greeting or an introduction. Uh, okay. But I had some pretty profound miracles of some prophetic events I was told over the course of my life, validated by him walking up to me and blessing a Japa Mala, which is a prayer bead, by fervently saying this prayer in the beating hot sun for hours because this prophecy that was told to me was really starting to annoy me. And there was miracle after miracle uh, that was transpiring in front of me and to me and with me, with Safiya Sai Baba, by my final asking, he was facing the opposite way in a crowd of 35,000. And I held up this prayer bead about this prophecy. And he turned around and walks over to me and blesses this bead. And when he did that, um, I was immediately looking at my personality self, sitting on the ground, holding up this prayer bead through his eyes. I was able to see my, my smaller self. Through him, this, at the same time I was looking at him as me, and through this curving back of the energy, this feedback loop that started to happen, I truly expanded in such a way I saw, and not visually, but it's still, it's still vision nonetheless, I saw the birth of our local universe. Awesome. And that yeah. book that is called For the Love of God? For the love of God, a spiritual journey. And that is that is on the Keith Blanchard blog at Achieve Radio. Also, your newest book, which is, uh, what is the name of that one again? That one is For the Love of God. The first one was The Divine Principle. The Divine Principle, yes. Yes, yes. And, and tell us about The Divine Principle. Well, when I had that visitation back in 1996, and I was awakened out of my sleep by a voice. I was impregnated with, I can't tell you how much information. Um, I sat in myself as the voice instructor, pressed record on my tape recorder, um, and out came volumes of material that I did not understand, didn't know what to do with. I didn't know how this process was even happening, that I could sit in my sofa very conscious, uh, have a tape recorder going, and my mouth would start moving, and it's not me doing it, because all I had to do was kind of sort of step aside and hear words coming out of my mouth that's being thunk from another intelligence. And I, it took me a while to process that. But after a while of, say about a year, of logging this raw material, um, in a meditation, I was told very, very clearly, very powerfully, um, Keith, let the rest of your life, until this book is published, um, your thoughts, your feelings, and your life experiences will be me, slash God, higher self, whatever term you want to deem it, um, as if I'm speaking to you. For example, I had a very serious question in the divine principle. Let's say you and I, Anne, um, say last week I asked a question about little children, something that is important. And I'm, I'm the voice piece of the human condition. I'm asking all those questions we want to know the answers to. Why do little children get sick and die? Okay? Mm -hmm. And, of course, I don't get any response. <laughs> I get mm -hmm. nothing. Sometimes mm -hmm. I would get information, and I would form a question around the information. Sometimes I would ask a question, and immediately right there I'd get an answer. Well, I would ask this question about why do little children get sick and die, and I get nothing. And I decided to go call my friend, Anne Marie, and invited her to lunch. And we're having lunch, and I hear these people who are a little loudmouthed, a few booths behind us, and they're just talking, and they're talking very loudly. And someone will give me the answer. <laughs> and I would know it by the way it made me feel. And it, the, usually the feeling was accompanied by a crying spell. Because it was beyond any bliss that, would, that I've ever experienced in my body. So you feel that... Um, I, I, a thought went through my head about... Um, I, call, I often tell people that if they'll <clears throat> just... When their problems are really terrible, or if they just, instead of... Um, harboring all their sorrow and misery in their house, if they'll just go on automatic pilot and take themselves wherever their angels or guides take, you know, uh, take them on the path to, oftentimes in the same way I say it can lead to um, 
for you a conversation in which the answers were said from two booths behind, or, or it can lead you to a book by Keith Anthony Blanchard, or it can be to this radio show, whatever. We have all found ourselves in situations where we have had a humongous problem and then only to find that we snap on the TV or we listen to a conversation two tables down or we find ourselves at Barnes and Nobles in front of a book that's exactly the answer that we want at the right time. Yeah. And so I always say that's automatic pilot, you know, where you let the un- you where you let your higher mind or spirit take you to the answer. So that sounds kind of like what you're talking about? Absolutely. It's it's the same process for every situation. It's not that difficult. Spirituality is not Sunday in church. It's not it's not this rigorous training that you need to become enlightened. You don't really ever become enlightened. If anything, you begin to remember. The system is so perfect and designed in such a simplistic way, as you described the automatic pilot, hearing the voice from two booths behind, situation shows up in your life, you have to learn to get out of the way. And trust that what Mm. is happening, as we spoke about earlier, that God is everywhere all the time, always talking to you through that person, that nice um, song on the radio, through that sweet smell of a flower, through that nice person saying something really pleasant to someone else. But even through those situations in your life that you judge as not good, well, that's from your perspective And your level of conscious awareness, of course, we use those words to describe that this really sucks for me right now. I get that. Mm. But when you go on automatic pilot, when you get out of the way and trust that what is happening to you is for your own good, when you can take a step aside, the universe would love you to do that so it can step in and intervene and influence and give you the very thing that you are wanting, which is beyond the scope of what you think you can even need for yourself. Yes, I, I agree. And I think that that's the most difficult part and where the analytical mind, we can become so addicted to, uh, to down uh, playing every wonderful automatic pilot thought we have simply by becoming addicted to analyzing. And what happens, I believe, too, is that when we go into that place, that analytical mind, then all of a sudden those moments where you, you need to step out of your own way uh, are complete. You have to, nothing is ever lost. It will come back. But I think that also every time you get addicted to that analyzing, um, you just keep prolonging your path work, prolonging your journey. And so I totally agree with you. Something that's come up to me quite often, in fact, in the last couple of weeks, quite a few times is, uh, and I know this is very, very sensitive ground, is when, and I can't even begin um, to lose the idea of losing a child. Uh, we know what it's like to lose loved ones, um, be it in partner relationships or even siblings or, mm-hmm. or family members or, or friends. Oh. But few of us um, have lost a child at an early age. And I, I, I am aware of the grieving period. But what I would like to share with those who may have had such an experience is I understand the, the holding on. But if you really want to grasp something, the essence of what you had, what you still have, and what you can nurture yourself and expand into lies and getting out of the way. Letting the guilt go of what you should have done, what you should have said, what you should have not not have said. And this dynamic really creates a downward spiral. And they call that the grieving process. And I think people use that word, the grieving process, sometimes as a cushion to stay in that place. But if you really want to recapture the joy and the expression of that being that was gifted to you in your life, and believe it or not, it even helps them on the other side. 
is when you begin to become equalized, when you find your equilibrium, or at least intentionally want that versus staying in this dark place and dwelling in this guilt and the, the idea of loss, loss, loss. Because in your rehabilitation of yourself, you can actually reconnect. And I think that's where the peace will lie is when people who have lost children begin to realize, wow, this is not forever. And not only is this temporary until I lay my body down, you mean I can have this communication now? I'm telling you that is an emphatic yes. Um, something that I've always found as interesting also, you mentioned that um, you had uh, you know, you talk to God. You also mentioned you saw you saw true divine energy through um, the other. What was his name? Ababa or whatever. Sai Baba. So, so there are, and you also mentioned that that true spirit is not found in a church. So, so the interesting thing I think is. What common denominator, now that you have seen, you know, when you, in your travels, what, what, how, and how um, true divinity walks and talks and things, and also how it felt to have that conversation with God, how, what do you think is the common denominator of people that are born on this planet that all carry true divinity. I mean, they're all ten, they, they aren't people that I think are necessarily the guy that, that is on the stage uh, making mega dollars to be able to have a TV church. I don't think it's always about, um, you know, fame, mm. but I also feel that what is it? What, in your experience, do you think all of the magic spark, the common denominator of Muhammad, Jesus, Buddha, mm. um, all of these, what is the common spark? Passion. Sincerity. Passion. Love. Truth. Beyond, a love that is beyond even your ability to grasp, at least at this moment. A love that is so far beyond... It's not an emotional love. It's an allowing. It's a letting things be kind of love. It's a, um, another word to describe the common denominator through all those beings would be silence, uh, patience. They're the, they are the embodiments of these finer, subtler divine qualities. And in, I recently had the opportunity <laughs> I don't know why God talks to me through phone calls. I have no idea. Uh, mm -hmm. A month ago, when I completely finished my last book, From the Love of God, as soon as I closed the document correcting the last mistake, I, I literally closed the document and said out loud, I stood up and said, thank you, God. I was on my way to the bathroom and my phone rings. And there's someone offering me to interview a yogi, a self-realized man, as Buddha, as Christ, a man who was self-realized. Um, I had the opportunity to have personal interviews with him. I did a radio interview with him. My point of bringing him up is being in the, his presence, um, there, is, there is an energy. It's so palpable. It is so concrete. But it is so subtle. I, I can't describe the power and the subtleness, the subtleness of these types of being. But this man, um, growing up, he was so passionate. He kept saying a particular mantra just about every breath of his life. That's the kind of drive. That's the kind of passion. That's the kind of sincerity that will only not put you in touch with God, will actually help you become the embodiment of can the passion also be, as you said, when you play music, that's part of your passion as well. So for all people that have an excitement or have their, uh, something they truly love to do, can, uh, can that also be a channel yes. for 
<laughs> yes, that's the gig. Um, I'm about Do What You Love. I have a movie called Do What You Love. You can get that at dowhatyoulovethemovie.com. It's a story about my life as a way shower. As I said earlier, my parents said, Keith, go get a job. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I ignored them. And I'm living my passion. To me, that passion is my direct conversation, my link to God. Because you ask any musician who is passionate about what they do, um, you come see my band if you can, or bands of the like. Three or four songs, it takes me to kind of fall in. Uh Once I fall in, I do not live on this planet. Uh It's it's something happens. We call it the zone. And Uh to answer your question, your passion, if God is love, Uh it makes sense to me that when you do what you love, you are in a direct alignment with love itself. Right. There's your spirituality. Make yourself Mm -hmm. blissful. Do those things that you were born here to do. When you do what you love, you are emitting so much light on this planet. I mean, you engulf the room. Musicians engulf the room. Artists captivate people. They put them in such a state of awe. I mean, these are real effects that happens from someone who is living from this center, a.k.a. passion. Do you feel... um Oh gosh, <laughs> left. Um, I was. Uh, I, oh, so basically, I feel too that what do we do? Have you ever met somebody that says, "I want to follow my passion, but I don't know what it is," or "I want to. I want to do what I do best in, but I don't know what it is. Mm. I, I don't know what I want. I don't know what I. What? You, have you ever met people like that? Yeah, and I absolutely have a question for the person that will help them find that very thing. And what was that? Well, a lot of ideas is, you know, you hear John or Jim Doe, you've heard the stories that the parents want them to grow up to be a lawyer or a doctor or this or that. And they're not interested in any of that That doesn't because they're not interested in the money. Well, what you do is you take the money out of the equation. What would I do every day just because I can? And that's what I want to do. Remove money from the equation, be it you're on an island <laughs> or the fact that you have so much money that you don't need it. Whatever the, the idea that you need to deduce it down to what is it I want to do. Mm-hmm. Now, this is not an anti-money campaign. You have to realize when you begin to live your passion, you become better at what you're doing than everybody else. So your mm-hmm. value goes up. And so the money, the abundance, the freedom, the prosperity, by law, goes along with that program. So you have to find out what you're doing by removing. It's more of a carving than it is trying to figure out. Remove all the stuff that you were programmed from society, parents, uh, the job force, uh, the the lawyer, the doctors, and the scientists, and whatever it is, all of those things that society thinks we should grow up to be to be, quote, successful. Ask yourself Mm -hmm. that very simple question. Um, What would I do if money was not involved? Look in the mirror. Great exercise. Look in a mirror, a full-size mirror. Go in your bathroom and stare in your eyes and say, what is it I want to do? An answer may not come through because, of course, because you're going to be maybe shy to look at yourself in the mirror and be saying, this seems a little silly and goofy. Again, you have to be serious about what you want because the mirror represents self-reflection. It'll help you dig within yourself by looking in your own eyes and by you see what you look like. You'll see the facade. You'll see that when you're being real and when you're being Uh honest. And when you're real and honest, that's where the magic happens. I think also um, what my mother always taught me when I was little was that, and just like you um, asking to hear the voice of God, my mother used to always tell me that if there was, if you needed to have an answer and you needed to have, and you were deeply concerned about something, whether it was depression or whether it was about finances or work or love or whatever, my mother always had told me that you put the question out to your guides and your angels and then you ask them to answer you in a dream. And um, you may not necessarily wake up in a startle like you did, but then again, 
there are some people that may it may be during a time they're in the shower or maybe in a time when they're in deeply engrossed in work or you know totally absent of thought that the answer that they were given in their dreams comes to them during the day um, or night so i i think that as you said it's oftentimes just a matter of humbling yourself, getting yourself out of your way, and reaching out and asking, like you did, um, I need to hear your voice, or I need an answer, something. Because when you're down and out and you feel like you're alone, you really aren't at all. I think it's all self-chosen. And if you can humble yourself or get out of your way and actually ask for divinity or for uh, spirit or your angels or God to answer, they will. Yeah, and you know, I I think that going through the process of asking, wanting to receive, I think that is for us. I don't think any of that really is necessary. We don't have to pray to say, hey, God, talk to me. I need you. Every day that we are alive on this planet, whether we're doing it consciously or just walking around at our job, we are praying. Every expression that comes off of your being is praying because the universe is receiving that and it's put, giving it back to you. So we don't have to formally ask, even though formally asking does show an intention. An intention is the key to everything, to willing your life into fruition. Intention is the key. Can you intend... By being, that's the best key, that's the master key. And, but, you know, for example, if you're familiar with Sai Baba, Sai means mother, Baba means father. He's a full divine incarnation of the Godhead. He walks around his, his, his ashram taking letters from people. Though he already knows what's on those letters, he takes those letters, and believe it or not, he actually reads every one. He takes those letters for the benefit of the person giving it. So they can feel heard. I think, and I wrote about this in For the Love of God, that I think it's far more beneficial for the person to feel heard than any of the jargon that's on the letter. Because when they feel they have been heard, the letter becomes moot. (laughs) And And that takes faith. Yeah, because when you feel that you have been heard, those things you were asking of, you're already exuding. Look, if you want to go through the process of writing, which I think is a great idea, try this. Write a letter. Use, write it with your hand. Don't type it out. Write it with your hand. Write a juicy, full-page letter. Put it in an envelope. Address it to God. And go stick it in a mailbox. <laughs> One, you've wrote it. You've written your concerns out. You know it's being delivered, not to someone's locale. Mm-hmm. But your intention mm-hmm. has been heard. and But now you right. might be able to trust a little easier that the answer is coming because you've done something mm-hmm. about it. Right. Versus just thinking in your head, you know, this is what I'm wanting. Can you please send me a man or a woman or a brand new car or that oh. parking spot during Christmas time at Walmart? <laughs> that hurts. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> like you said, those are am- part of our analytical mind, not part of yeah. our... Um, because I don't believe that, uh, you know, that's the one thing that I feel torn about with mega dollar ministers and um, gurus that are, you know, making a lot of money and things. Um, I, I feel that somewhere along the way, money does. I know that its abundance is supposed to be for all, but there was a re- there's a reason that many of the master spiritualists do not walk with money. You know, no. they do, right. they they because it leads to it leads to want of the wrong things. It leads to I me me I I want I want I want, and it never stops. It just keeps coming, and. And there's nothing wrong with money, especially, if, you know, I mean, it makes life easier. But on the other hand, it sounds like that, um, who you were just talking about, was he somebody that lived in wealth? Um, 
I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, my mind is going to Sai Baba, but that's not. Is that who you're referring to? Yes. Did he live in no. wealth? No, no, and no, not not whatsoever. Um, you know, we yogis are people, are men, people, women as well, who over the course of their life they become one with infinite consciousness. They become God. Sai Baba is known as an avatar. They're born that way. They don't go through some part of their life and then have this amazing self-realization, this epiphany, and they go, ah, I am it. Um, they're, they're actually born with this level of consciousness. Now, a Mahavatar is not born at all. These beings can literally pop out of body out of nothing. But you were talking about money. When I was on Sai Baba's ashram, absolute true story, I had first row. There was a gentleman. You've got to keep in mind, everybody is sardined into this temple. 35,000 people so they sit you in lotus position, back to back, back to front, front to back, side to side, and everybody's around you. Well, anyway, this gentleman says, Saidam, meaning kind of like namaste, when Sai Baba come in, can I lean on your shoulder if I have to, to give him this letter that I have for him, that we just spoke about, people give him letters. I said, Absolutely. I mean, just like a divine script. <laughs> Sai Baba mm -hmm. comes in a temple, comes in a temple. And walks right up to me, well, my position, to look at the guy two rows, three rows behind me. And the guy is leaning over. He put all of his weight on my shoulder, reaching, extending his arm as far as he can to give Sai Baba this letter, which is in a brown envelope. And Sai Baba never takes his eyes off of it, uh, off the gentleman. He pats the letter in his hand three times, and he throws it back at the guy, almost with disgust. Threw it back at him, and he walks off. Uh, oh, before oh, wow. he walks off. Yeah, before he walks off, he says, "You should know better than to give me something like that." And he walks off. And after Sai Baba was completely out of our proximity, I reached back and I said, "What did you give him?" He said, "I gave him some money." Oh, wow. Yeah, he told him there are proper channels for you to contribute to the growth of the hospital, which is free. Anyone can go there and have uh, be treated, and so forth. There are certain things that are funded. But he want no, wanted no part of that whatsoever. Right. He didn't need it. I mean, he, he's the infinite consciousness behind, you know, the creation of everything. He so need if we, we have three minutes and 28 seconds, so let's, let's go full circle and, and give yourself a, um, let's simplify your, your mission statement. <sighs> mission statement. Become the embodiment of heaven on earth. Anchor that which is you, the real you, the true you, the you that you are, onto this planet and watch not only what happens in this world, but watch what happens to you and to those around you. I invite you to take whatever it is you are afraid of and walk right into it. And you're probably saying, Keith, you're a fool. I know. Jesus was a fool. <laughs> Um, and I'm not nowhere parallel in my life to Christ, but, the t but, but yet the teaching. Walk into your fears. Walk into your fears. If you need guidance, so be it. But you will never grow until you move beyond those barriers of darkness, your own fears. I had a friend of mine saying, Keith, people are insane when they say the only way to find God is follow the light. You have to follow the darkness. The darkness is what's going to lead you to the light because that's what's blocking the light from expressing itself through you. Um, I know the world outside is convincing. Don't buy into it. Doesn't mean you have to close off your compassion, your compassion center. You can use your compassion and radiate that out into the world. But don't buy into the illusion, the maya, the lie. It's not real. Don't believe what you see on TV. Don't believe what you see happening in the world. Why is all this happening in the world? I can't begin to explain to you the karma that each person must carry out on this planet. But I do know this as a fact. From my experiences with higher creations, higher energies, higher levels of light, that all the people that are dying, all the, quote, evil that's in the world, it is purposeful. It's all coming to a zenith. It's all coming to a climax. And those who have leftover karma, yes, I am aware that it may come in the form of children. Yes, I am aware it may come in the form of families being killed by these hate groups. I, I'm aware of all that. But beyond the, the curtain of the theater, we, we have no idea who wrote this script. You have your own script. 
you make the best of your life. So and follow your own, follow your own script. Don't plug into the negativity and uh, get out of your way and let yeah. spirit direct you, whether it be automatic pilot or through messages of God, and read your books, which are quick, 34 seconds. Uh, the Divine Principle, Anchoring Heaven on Earth. You can find it on Amazon, and shortly at Amazon you will find, For the Love of God, uh, A Spiritual Journey. One thing I want to say in closing, someone asked me that question about all the stuff that's going on in the world, is when you can realize that your life on this planet is not about the survival of your body, but about the evolution of your soul that may find you some comfort and some peace. Thank you very much, Keith. <laughs> Keith Thank you. Greatly. Anthony Blanchard. Bye-bye. Namaste. Psychic Radio, Holistic Radio, Spiritual Radio. This is AchieveRadio.com. Follow us on Twitter at Twitter.com slash AchieveRadio. Hi, I'm Anne Marie O'Dell at Achieve Radio's Tarot Joy. Come on upstairs, grab yourself a tapestry pillow, and get a down home, honest reading with 30 years master tarot channeling experience. In addition, I will have a weekly spiritual guest from around the world. That's two readings per call for you. After the show, I invite you to come on over to thecallingoflight.com. I offer PayPal readings at 15-minute or 30-minute sections of time. All yours to thecallingoflight.com.